Hello and good morning and happy new year. Welcome to the 11 a.m. Sunday Assembly at the Orange Vale Church of Christ. My name is Chuck Polis and in addition to the online assembly that's happening right now, we also have an in-person indoor assembly that happens at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings. And so if you're in the neighborhood next Sunday morning, we pray that you'll join us. Later on today at 6, we have a Zoom adult Bible class that's looking at the Gospel of John. And tonight we're going to be in John chapter 17. And then later on this week, Wednesday, we'll have a Zoom adult Bible class at 7 that's doing a study called What We Believe and Why. And the purpose of that class is to help us understand why we do what we do and why we believe what we believe and how we could better help others believe what the Bible says. We also have a Zoom children's class that happens on Tuesdays at 5.30 p.m. And that class is for children between the ages of 8 and 12. Plus, we also have a more sort of comprehensive, work-at-your-own-pace Bible study that happens online with a real-life Bible study helper. And you can sign up for that by visiting our website at ovchurch.org and clicking on the banner for World Bible School. And if you need any information more on those classes, even some tech support on getting connected with Zoom, please message us through YouTube or Facebook, or you can email me directly at minister at ovchurch.org so that we can get you the Zoom ID and the class materials that you need and get you connected. Now, if you prefer an in-person Bible study, you're welcome to join us Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. here at our building in our fellowship hall as we examine the life of Christ. We also want to make sure that everyone's aware that after every 9 a.m. assembly here Sunday mornings, we have a Cocoa and Cookies Fellowship, and everyone's invited to join us. I've recently been made aware of a handful of Christians in the area who've come down with the Omicron variant of COVID-19. And so we want to pray for their well-being and their quick recovery. We also want to pray for everyone who's been affected by the recent Colorado wildfires. Um, living in California with the wildfires that happen every year, we uh, definitely empathize with their plight. And so we want to reach out to them and make sure that uh, they can be blessed with ways to recover. As always, if you have any announcements for next week's bulletin or prayer requests, please let us know. Let's pray. Father God, dear Father, we thank you for another new year. And Father, we pray that as we go through 2022, that we'll do things that glorify you. And Father, we ask that you'll uh, be with those who are struggling with COVID-19, no matter the variant. And we want to pray for all those in Colorado who've been affected by the wildfires. May you bless them, and, and Father, might you use us to be a blessing to them. Father, we ask for your guidance and your mercy throughout all of our lives and your blessings upon our assembly today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. The scripture reading for today is taken from the book of 1 Timothy. I'll be reading 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verses 6 through 10 for an international version. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. 
This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture, now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above Echoes of mercy, whispers of love This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. There are things as we travel this earth-shifting sands that transcend all the reason of man. It's at this time that we would like to invite you to share in the Lord's Supper with us wherever you may be. Close to 2,000 years ago, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples gathered together to share the Passover with Jesus. Picking up in verse 26 of Matthew chapter 26, we're told that while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. 
And so now almost 2,000 years after Jesus first gave his disciples the command to remember him in the bread and the cup, we gather together, no matter the number, no matter the place, and share the bread and the cup to remember what Jesus has done in going to the cross and shedding his blood so that we could be forgiven of our sins and saved. Let's take this time to remember Jesus' sacrifice for us in the bread and the cup. Let's pray. Father God, again, we want to thank you so much for this bread. Father, this bread that symbolizes your son's body. And Father, as we think about this precious gift that you've given us, we give our thanks in Jesus' name. Let's continue in prayer, shall we? Father God, again, we want to thank you. Thank you so much, Father, for this cup, this cup that symbolizes your son's blood that was shed on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins and be saved. Father, we thank you again for this precious gift. In Jesus' name. And that concludes the Lord's Supper. And it's at this time, out of a matter of convenience, that we take up the offering. Again, I want to thank all those who have either mailed in or brought by their support for the church here in Orangevale. May God continue to bless you as you have blessed others. Let me share with you a passage from 2 Corinthians. This is chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7, where the Apostle Paul writes, To remember this, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so, if you're able, we ask that if you can help support the ministry here in Orangevale and the missions that we help to support around the world, that you do so as a cheerful giver. Let's pray. Father God, again, we want to thank you so much for blessing us with all good things. And Father, as we think about the work of your church and the furthering of your kingdom, we pray that you will help us to be cheerful givers and be a blessing to others as you have blessed us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As always, you're welcome to bring your offering by the next time you visit us here in Orangevale. Or feel free to use whatever service your bank offers, like bill pay. Or if you like, you can simply write us a check and mail it off to 5915 Main Avenue, Orangevale, California, 95662. It's at this time that we want to encourage you to sing along with the song before the message today. God is the fountain whence ten thousand blessings flow. To Him my life, my health and friends, and every good I owe. The comforts He affords are neither goes that one evening a husband is balancing the checkbook and he says to his wife honey 
You know that old saying, how money talks? Well, ours said, so long. And don't we feel that way sometimes? You know what I mean? Maybe it's because the world that we live in runs on money and it seems that we never have enough of it. And because of that, sometimes, sometimes the understanding of the way money works and having the right perspective on it isn't always that easy, especially for children. For example, one day a mother stopped at her local bank and allowed her six-year-old daughter to help out with the ATM, you know. And when the little girl had pushed the right buttons and the money came out of the machine, that girl squealed with excitement and said, look, mommy, we won. Of course, we all know that that's not the way it works, even though we sometimes wish it did, right? And that's because the rich are often objects of other people's envy. Think about it, you know, they drive expensive cars and live in big houses, mansions where custom tailored clothes and flash expensive jewelry and travel to exotic places. And so we look to them and we sometimes wish that we could swap places with them. But that's not really the answer to our deepest needs. Years ago, in a business magazine, I believe it was Forbes, billionaire, politician, and philanthropist Ross Perot had this to say about material wealth. He said, remember, if you get real lucky, if you make a lot of money, if you go out and buy a lot of stuff, it's gonna break. You got your biggest, fanciest mansion in the world, he says, it has air conditioning, it's got a pool, just think of all the pumps going in and out of it. Or if you go to a yacht basin in any place in the world, nobody is smiling. And he says, I'll tell you why. It's because something broke that morning. The generator's out, the microwave doesn't work. Things, Perot said, just don't mean happiness. Think about it, you know, we might fantasize about what it would be like to live like the rich and the famous, you know. But we need to realize that the unqualified yearning for money and the things that it can buy can actually be spiritually dangerous. And that's because when we see what God has to say in his word, we usually read about how the rich are often the subjects of divine scorn and condemnation. Take, for example, Luke chapter 6 and verses 24 and 25, where Jesus said, but woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well-fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. And then over in Luke chapter 18 and verse 24, Jesus summed up his encounter with the rich young ruler, saying how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, just to make it clear, Jesus is not teaching that it's a sin to be rich and that it's godly to be poor, okay? And Jesus isn't teaching that the rich cannot enter the kingdom. But there is a spiritual danger that we need to avoid when it comes to money. Think about it. It is God who gives his people the ability to achieve wealth. And it is God who sometimes shows the sign of his special favor upon his people by giving them an abundance of wealth. Like Abraham, for example. At the same time, God also lets us know that poverty is sometimes, it's sometimes caused by laziness and therefore forbids the church to assist a person in such circumstances. So, what is it then that God wants us to know about earthly riches? Well, it's simply that we are not to put our trust in riches. Instead, we are to put our trust in the God who gives us all things. Jesus said it this way over in Matthew chapter 6 and verses 19 through 21. He said, Do not store up for yourself treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves 
treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So as we continue looking at the book of James in our sermon series, A Faith That Works, we see James in chapter 5 and verses 1 through 6 making some of the same points that Jesus just made there in Matthew chapter 6. Again, this is James chapter 5 and verses 1 through 6, where James writes, Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that's coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded the wealth... <clears throat> You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you fa failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who are not opposing you. Now, Let's clear the air on something first. Again, James isn't criticizing the rich just because they were rich. And that's because, like, again, Abraham, for example, riches can be a blessing. Or, on the other hand, like the rich young ruler, riches can be a terrible curse. It really all depends upon how our riches were acquired and what our attitudes are toward those riches and how they're used. And here in James chapter 5, we see that James wants to impress upon us two very important truths. And the first thing that James wants us to see is the ultimate worthlessness of earthly riches. And so he talks about the miseries of materialism. Starting back at verse 1 of James chapter 5, James again says, Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Okay, so, just who are these rich people that James is talking about here? Are they Christians or are they non-Christians? Well, in this case, they're most likely non-Christians. And that's because James doesn't call them brethren, but simply, you rich people. And in the context, we see that he's talking about people who are dealing unjustly with folks like Christians. Now, I know that some people think that doesn't make sense, because if this letter is written to Christians, then why in the world would James give a stern rebuke to non-Christian rich people? Well, simply because James is pointing out how evil they are, so that Christians won't want to envy them or try to be like them. Think about it. The rich, are, the rich are often looked at as people being very comfortable and secure, and their lifestyles usually include all the luxuries that, well, anyone can possibly imagine, right? But if the non-Christian rich people knew what kind of misery was ahead of them, they would weep and wail. Just look at what James has to say in verse 5. He talks about them using a rather vivid illustration of an animal fattened for the day of slaughter, saying, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Just picture that, you know. Picture yourself uh, a cow or a pig, just truly pigging out, if you will, right? Just as happy as can be, you know, gorging themselves at the abundance of food set before them. And that animal might think to themselves, oh, that food is just so good. That's, they gave that food just for me so I could fill up my belly. But in reality, it's only leading to their demise, right? In other words, they're being fattened up for the day of slaughter. All right? Make some hamburgers, steaks, and bacon, and, and some ham. Yeah, that's it. And so James gives us the point that these certain rich people if they don't get their act together, James says if these certain rich people don't get their act together, 
that destruction awaits them on the day of final judgment. Think about it, even though money can buy all kinds of stuff, it can't buy spiritual security when you stand before the judge of heaven and earth. Money can't buy your way into heaven. Back in verses 2 and 3, James has more to say about these particular rich folk, noting, Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in these last days. Now, James talks about their riches here by dividing them into three main categories, doesn't he? Food stuff, expensive apparel, and precious metals. And so he tells them that their highly perishable riches of food and grain is going to end up rotting. And that their expensive clothes are eventually going to be eaten up by moths and just fall apart. And that their precious gold and silver would ter deteriorate in beauty and value, adding that their corrosion would be a testimony against them. That they have placed their trust in the wrong things, you see. And that because of that, the loss of these things would eat at their flesh like fire. In other words, they put all their trust in their riches instead of God, you see. The person who has their entire life wrapped up in their riches, all that awaits them is complete ruin. After all, Peter writes in 2 Peter 3.10, it's all going to burn up anyway. And so the only things that are going to survive the coming judgment are those spiritual riches that are eternal and can't be destroyed, like, James, like Jesus talked about back in Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> now, the second truth that James wants us to see is the result of a person who puts their trust in riches rather than in God. And so he talks about the sins of materialism. Again, remembering that being blessed by God is not sinful, but being wrapped up in materialism is sinful. Just like the Apostle Paul warned Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and verses 9 and 10, saying that people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And when we compare what Paul had to say to what James wrote back in verses 4 through 6, we find three of those sins. Again, James wrote in verse 4, Look, the wages you failed to pay, the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Verse 5, You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Verse 6, you have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. And you look at that and say, okay, so the sins of materialism. What's the first sin of materialism that James identifies here? Well, back in verse 4, clearly, it's injustice. Think about it. If someone agreed to pay someone for a particular job, but then they didn't pay them like they promised, well, then they've sinned. Going back to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 24 and verses 14 and 15, the law said that an employer wasn't allowed to hold a poor man's wages past sundown, remembering that they got paid daily, not weekly or bi-monthly or monthly or whatever like we often do today. And so they needed that money, right? And, and both the prophets Jeremiah and Malachi pronounced divine judgment against those who oppressed hired servants or refused to pay them what they earned. Again, just think about it. Someone who loves money and is only concerned about profits is going to do whatever they can to, to get more money, even at the expense of mistreating their workers. And what was true back in James' day is sadly still going on today. 
And that means that those who are employers need to think long and hard about how they are treating their employees. And for the rest of us who aren't employers, well, it's important for us to think about how we spend our money, right? And who we do business with and how generous we are when we have the opportunity to reward good work, like let's say a server at a restaurant. Do we tip well, you know? The second sin of materialism that we see in these three verses is the sin of selfishness. Back in verse five, James pictures materialistic people and their desire for luxury and self-indulgence without even thinking about helping those in need. Over in Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells a story about an unnamed rich man and a poor man named Lazarus. And there in verses 19 through 21, Jesus says that there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, in the story, Jesus talks about a rich man who is living the good life, right? He's living the good life in his luxurious home in his gated community with all the foods and pleasures anyone could ever imagine. But just outside his gate was poor man Lazarus very poor, very sick. And sadly, the rich man had absolutely no concern for Lazarus at all and didn't think once to help him out with anything. And so that example shows us that the thing that we've got to be careful about is acting like the rich man who has no concern for the poor and who selfishly spends all his money on himself and that means when it comes to you and me, what we've got to ask ourselves is, no matter how much or how little money we have, do we spend it all on ourselves? Or do we have a heart for others and a desire to share some of what God has blessed us with, even as little as it might be? Take, for example, the poor widow over in Mark chapter 12. Speaking of Mark, over in chapter 4 of the Gospel of Mark, in verse 19, Jesus warns us, saying that the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. The point is, we need to make sure that materialism doesn't choke out the word of God in our lives, but instead we allow God's word to help us grow and therefore make us fruitful. Okay, the third and final sin of materialism that we see in our text is murder. Murder. James' point in our text is that those who would unjustly deny someone their wages so that they could probably go off and live in some sort of selfish pleasure, just add to it some, you know, could easily become involved in actual murder. And that's because without that worker's daily wage, they might not be able to, to get food for the day and, and feed themselves and their families. They might not be able to pay a debt that they owe that would cause them to otherwise be enslaved or even, you know, worse, executed. Back in 1 Kings chapter 21, we read about the wicked and selfish king Ahab who desperately wanted a vineyard vineyard that belonged to Naboth. But Naboth didn't sell him his vineyard. And that got Ahab all really upset. And so after throwing himself a pity party, his wife comes in, Queen Jezebel, wicked Queen Jezebel. And Jezebel had Naboth killed, murdered, so that her husband could go ahead and have that vineyard. And while we don't see stuff like that happening so blatantly today, there are people selfishly murdering others just for money all the time with things like drug and human trafficking. And let's not forget those who get rich off of peddling products that harm others. 
maybe produce pollution that brings sickness and death with things like, I don't know, uh, tobacco or toxic chemical dumping, asbestos, and so on and so on. And what about taking away things that are necessary for someone and their family to live on? Isn't that likely to take their life? There's this old Jewish saying that says, to cheat a poor man and take away his living is to murder him. That's because you'll have nothing left. You'll starve to death or die of disease or something. And sadly, James points out that some of the people who the rich had condemned and murdered were in fact good and godly people. You know, it's one thing for someone to lose their life in the doggy dog world of crime or corporate corruption, but it's something altogether different for the innocent and the righteous to be lost in the crossfire. And so we're warned about the sins of materialism, about injustice and selfishness and murder. And just to be clear again, you don't need to have a lot of money to be materialistic. And that's because it's a mindset, right? Remember, you could have a lot of money and not be materialistic. You could also have next to nothing and be more materialistic than someone who has a lot of money. It all comes down to our mindset, what we do with our money, how we treat it, right? How we spend it, how we save it, how we use it. And that's because what we do with our money shows what's in our hearts. Our money talks, revealing who we truly follow and serve. Remember, no one can serve two masters, Jesus said. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Just think about what happened to those greedy liars, Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. They ended up dying because of their materialism, because of their greed and selfishness, because of their lies to get that money and keep it. Think about it. Money can buy a lot of things, but it can't buy everything. It can't buy health, it can't buy happiness, it can't buy a good name, and it surely can't buy your way into heaven. It can't buy you trust, can't buy you respect, can't buy you salvation. So what is your use of money saying about you? Is it saying that you're cheating and exploiting others? Or is it saying that you're greedy and selfish? Is it saying that you are materialistic? Or is it saying that you're compassionate? Is it saying that you're generous? Is it saying that you're rich toward God and others? If you're here today and you're not a Christian yet, quit putting it off and admit that you've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, realizing that God sent Jesus to die on the cross so that we could have the forgiveness of sins and be saved. So confess him as Lord and Savior. Commit yourself to him by being immersed in the watery grave for the forgiveness of your sins. And then when you rise up out of the water, you'll be born again to live your life for him until Jesus comes back again or you go to be with him. And if you're already a Christian, remember that our money talks. And it lets people know who we truly follow and serve. And prayerfully, it says that you follow and serve the God of heaven and earth. And so if anyone has the need to share, to seek prayer, or to become a Christian for the very first time, I would like to encourage you to message us through Facebook or YouTube, or you can email us directly at minister at ovchurch.org, and we'll see what we can do to help you out. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for blessing us so much, Father. We want to thank you for giving us so many good things. And Father, as we think about all that you've blessed us with, help us to only put our trust in you, the giver of all good things, not on those things themselves. Help us to focus on giving glory to you and being a blessing to others as you have blessed us. We thank you so much in Jesus' precious name. Again, we want to thank you for making us a part of your Lord's Day and pray that you'll worship with us the next time we meet in Orangevale, Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Of course, we do understand that that might not be possible for everybody, and so we 
do hope that you'll continue to worship with us online Sunday mornings at 11 here on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you and God bless.